Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to our third webinar in our series of helping people communicate more effectively. Um, we started this as we were going into lockdown and fortunately we're now in a position where we are communicating um, hopefully as effectively as possible um, out of lockdown. Um, so my name is Julie Molesdale. I'm joined by uh, my colleague Michelle Burns, um, who's going to co-host this with me. Uh, and I'm absolutely delighted to have Caroline Cooney from Industrial Biotechnology Innovation Centre, Jennifer Kennedy from Homes for Scotland, Martin Mackay from Clyde Gateway, and Julie Cosgrove from Caledonia Housing Association with me today. Um, so we'll go through. Thanks so much for everybody to take time out on what I think is kind of a sunny <laughs> Friday afternoon uh, and hopefully um, you'll get some really good tips. Um, we've had some great feedback on the webinars that we've done so far um, so we just really want to share as much as possible. Um, we're in a scary time and actually I think arguably coming out of lockdown is probably going to be even more difficult um, of going into it and I know the panellists have got some thoughts on that. Um, so really what we want to do is to support you in this scary time. Communications is one of the few things you can actually control. Um, so it's important that we um, we do everything we can to, to do that and indeed to the last couple of months to help our clients with that. So without further ado, um, just move on to the next slide, which is obviously how can you communicate effectively so in terms of today, um, very brief introduction, then we're really going to get use the most of the time uh, getting insights from the panellists. Um, we know the panellists pretty well, we know their organisations very well, and some of the things they've achieved through lockdown have been absolutely incredible, um, and hopefully there's some really good learnings in there um, that can be shared and are applicable um, across all industries and organisations, no matter what size of the industry. And then what we'll do is um, get some views on what should we be thinking about and are there any lessons and what are the panel's views um, as we emerge um, from lockdown. You will have a facility. Uh, thank you very much for everyone who has already provided some questions. We will try to answer as many of those as possible. And indeed, I've shared with some of these with the panel in advance. So I think actually some of the points will be addressed by the panelists as we go through. Um, but if we don't address the questions, then um, make sure that you answer. If you've got any additional questions, make sure you ask them and we will come back to you. So we'll spend about 15 minutes on the Q&A um, and then we will go to uh, a wee poll and um, close. So uh, that's ourselves from um, Perceptive. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we specialise, we're Scotland's only property specialist communications consultancy. We work with a range of different organisations, large and small, across the construction and property sector and also in life sciences and biotechnology. And we're very fortunate that uh, both of Scotland and IBIYC have actually supported this series and uh, promoted it amongst their members. So thank you very much um, for that. Um, we're very fortunate and we've had numerous awards, not just for our work with our clients, but also for ourselves. Um, but really, it's all about the panelists today and getting their views. Um, so what we're going to do is find out what's worked particularly well and any pointers or things to consider. Um, but just to give them uh, as much as insight as possible, I'm actually just going to um, launch a wee poll for you to complete, if that's okay. It's just about your views on communication at the moment, and that will help frame it for the panel, if that's okay. Thank you. 
Sorry, I thought it was 1853. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share the results with you. Um, so, largely people are finding communication a bit more difficult um, during lockdown. And the most challenging um, issue that people have got is the constantly changing situation. So um, that's something that um, certainly the panellists have discussed with me beforehand and I'm sure will, um, will be mentioned um, in their discussions. Um, so Martin, can I just hand over to you just to talk a bit about what Clyde we have done um, in terms of how they've been communicating, what sort of things they've been doing, what's worked particularly well and what might be useful to share. Okay, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is the, the first time that I've been involved as a panellist in the, uh, one of these sessions, so a little bit, uh, a little bit nervous, not, not like me, but uh, I'm going to go through, through a few points. And first of all, thank you to Perceptive for inviting us on. Uh, we've worked with Perceptive for a number of years across a whole range of campaigns. Uh, and on a range of different types of projects. So we're kind of used to trying to deal with kind of changing situations and, and ways in which we have to try and be innovative in how we communicate uh, and also how we can be consistent and direct in our, our communications. I wanted maybe to personally touch upon the, the kind of coronavirus element and how we as a company uh, communicated our business continuity plan quite early on. And we did that with early and clear messages, but it wasn't, we didn't mention coronavirus, we didn't say that was the reason, we just simply stated that we were implementing our business continuity plans. People knew why, why we would be doing that, because what we wanted to do was to focus on our supporting our customers, our partners and our stakeholders in our community. So we took that initial step, was about shifting the focus away from us as a company and what we were doing to maintain our business, but what we were doing in order to support the organisations that, that, that engage with us. And then after that, we paused and, and took stock of the, the situation. And I think maybe that's the first lesson, that uh, it's important to know when not to communicate. Um, if you communicate at a point where you're uncertain about what your message is, maybe you're uncertain about what, what the future might be, then sometimes it's better to reflect uh, before you communicate. And I think during this process, I'd seen a number of communications from people which started to perhaps have, slight, uh, have tones that, that were slightly panicked uh, or gave unnecessary uncertainty to their customers or stakeholders. And so we were conscious that we didn't want to do that. So we paused and took, took stock. Uh, after that, we, 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 we changed the message. We felt that we needed to be much, much more positive to focus not on the current situation, uh, but to look at to look ahead and to see what we could do as an organisation. So our recent messaging has been about positive reinforcement. Uh, as a company, we were due to go and present at Mipham with a range of the Scottish partners. And so we took a number of the projects that we were intending to showcase at, at Mipham uh, and we moved them onto to social platforms with a range of coming soon activities. So the types of uh, things that might be happening post lockdown and the types of projects that we would like to bring forward. So from there, we've then built a little, uh, we've built on from that. Uh, we've looked at the construction industry restarting, and uh, some of you may recently have seen uh, the press release that we put out about the range of activity that would be restarting in Clyde Gateway. So we went across all of the construction activity in Clyde Gateway, we totaled it all up, and we said actually there's 150 million pounds worth of activity that can get back on the ground in the coming weeks and months. Um, and that's probably been one of the largest engagements that we've had uh, on uh, a release or a campaign in, in recent years. And it's reinforced for us in terms of the, the lessons that people want positive stories. They want to see what the positive steps are uh, coming forward. So for us, that was a genuine attempt to promote Clyde Gateway and what was happening, but also a genuine attempt uh, to put out a positive message. So as an organisation, uh, our efforts are now on recovery and we are developing a recovery plan uh, that's currently titled Clyde Gateway, Rebuilding a Resilient Economy and Community. Um, as a regeneration company, we need to be delivering our, uh, our efforts on the ground in Clyde Gateway. So we're really, really keen to get back to the office and get back to business as usual. But what we do know is that we will have to change and adapt. 
And so we're looking at what we've defined as short, medium and longer term opportunities, uh, looking at where we can make a difference and where we might have to change and adapt our practices. Um, and whilst the, the focus is naturally on those short term things that we need to do to restart, we're also looking critically at where the opportunities might be for us as an organisation over the medium and long term. And we do feel that there are opportunities there in terms of how we can positively promote Clyde Gateway as an area in which people can live and work. So I think the message is from me is that you need to be clear and direct uh, in your communications. You need to be open and honest uh, and you need to be positive. Thank you. That's great, Martin. Thank you very much. And um, I think that really resonates with my understanding of Clyde Gateway as an organisation of being very practical, very straightforward and, and very honest. Um, and, you know, getting those positive messages out. Um, I don't know how many of the audience are involved with external communications as well as internal, but we, we know from our work with our, our clients and the media is that the media for once are absolutely desperate for positive stories. So if you have got anything positive to tell them, um, maybe how you've been dealing with this, um, and actually even with politicians as well, um, they're keen to hear about some positive things as well. Um, so that there's quite a good um, cut through. Um, so that, that's really that's really great. Thank you very much. Um, Jennifer, do you mind if we move to you? I think you've got a great story to tell about how you've really made the most of, you've actually turned a, a negative situation on its head. Sorry, I think you maybe need to unmute yourself, Jennifer. Sorry, that's it. Sorry. There you go. That's me. Um, well, thanks everyone, um, uh, and and also thanks to Julie for inviting homes for Scotland to take part today. It's uh, it's always rewarding when you get feedback that someone did a, a a good job, especially from our uh, sort of uh, experts like Perceptor. Well, we've got a lot of different audiences to communicate with as a, as a membership organisation, but given the size of our team, the scale of what happened when lockdown was introduced and how quickly things moved, we um, absolutely prioritised members, ministers and Scottish government officials in terms of uh, who our um, communications would be focused on. Right from the outset, we had told members that we were going to actively restrict the amount of emails we sent them, so that it was really very much be on a need to know basis so that um, we wouldn't be blocking up their inboxes so they could focus on matters at hand but it quickly became apparent that pretty much everything fell under the need to know basis um, and in terms of just uh, demonstrating that last year we issued a total of like 40 news alerts to, to members but in the last three months we've already well exceeded that total um, I think we're on number like 54 now. Um, so it was kind of a, a complete turnaround from what we expected, but we just felt the information was that important to members to keep them informed of what was going on in our conversations with officials. So we kind of effectively held back our engagement with the media, media and the wider political base as far as possible, primarily because we wanted to avoid any inadvertent negative impact on the delicate discussions we were having with the, the government. So it was the 16th of April before we actually made any public statement and that was actually tying into comments that have been made specifically by Finance Secretary Kate Forbes uh, and highlighting the role that our industry had to play in uh, coming out the other side of the crisis. But what that strategy also meant was turning down some media opportunities to, to let others speak. But what this enabled us to do actually was to tell and demonstrate to the Scottish Government in no uncertain terms that this was actually a position that we would not be able to maintain if we didn't see any sort of progress on the talks that were underway. So um, as things progressed, that led us to making public a letter that our board sent jointly to the First Minister. And this was really highlighting the plight of 6,000 households that were waiting quite desperately to move into largely completed homes. Um, and this literally then took on a life of its own, um, being picked up by the people affected who were contacting their own MSPs, lobbying directly with the First Minister and the Housing Minister um, quite effectively. It was really quite incredible how quickly it grew just in the space of sort of 24 hours. Um, 
So to the extent that um, I think the, we actually had to try delicately sort of convey to that group that perhaps we needed to dial it down a little bit because actually the minister of officials was getting taken up with dealing all these dealing with all these various communications that were coming in. Um, and so perhaps distracting them a bit from sort of the matter at hand. Um, but anyway, it's uh, it's still going. Um, still been working on that this morning. But it, it just goes to show one of, one of the things we've always been keen to do, particularly before the lockdown, in terms of highlighting the uh, the the lack of housing that's available, is trying to get sort of the silent majority involved uh, in terms of highlighting the need for more new homes. So this is something we might look at again um, and we can go forward. But in, in terms of uh, what I've learned from the whole experience, I think other than the, the definitely things that simply can't be planned for uh, and that things can and do get worse very quickly, I would say it was more a sort of real the past experience, particularly for our organisation when we think back to the 2008 experience. So I would say for us, what's been the, the most valuable is being a strong and agile team um, with like really strong personal relationships with each other. The, uh, the way we've been able to react and adapt really quickly, just acknowledging the fact from the get-go that you're not going to be able to please everyone all the time within a, a white region membership, but you have to take a position and then own it, even when you don't necessarily know the answers. Um, and I think also reflecting back on the big change our organisation has been in the last two or three years with a relatively new strategy, I think it's allowed us to live our values that we've, that we've actually um, put in black and white, which for us is working collaboratively, being respectful um, and being evidence and solutions led. And I really do think that's paid dividends in terms of the outcomes we've managed to achieve um, for members from the Scottish Government not only by way of the announcement yesterday when we were able to sort of get lockdown lifted a week earlier than expected, but and also in terms of the um, uh, £100 million pounds SME home build for emergency liquidity fund that we managed to um, develop in conjunction with the Scottish Government. From a personal point, point of view, I found our ability to now to be able to measure our output as outcomes to be particularly rewarding. So using things like for social media and also a, a particular tool that we use called Coverage Book, whereby you can just pull all your stuff together and it aggregates it all. Um, I'd love to be able to use a tool like Meltwater, but it's, it's out of our budget, unfortunately. But um, the use of news aggregators as well, for example, um, and the public affairs sphere news directs, which we've started subscribing to now, uh, just pulling everything together so we don't have to sort of spread our resources even more thinly um, and keeping us uh, abreast of everything that's happening across Scottish Parliament and Westminster. So that's, that's it in a nutshell for me. Great, uh, Jennifer. Listen, we're getting a wee bit of feedback from your microphone. I've muted everybody, um, but just let you know it's just a wee bit, I'm um, hearing a wee bit of um, feedback. Um, <laughs> But um, that's some really great tips in there, Jennifer, and I think you've almost kind of uh, hidden your light a wee bit under a bushel about the 6,000 homes um, campaign. That was a really great campaign, and I think what we're seeing, just simply because of necessity, that actually planning consultations and consultations are much more going online. Um, so it's, I think, you know, the lockdown has driven that, but I think that's here to stay. And I think that can hopefully help help harness that silent um, majority. Um, so watch this space. Um, but thank you very much for that, Jennifer. That's really, really helpful. Um, so Julie, would you mind just sharing a wee bit of the fantastic things you guys have been doing at Caledonia Housing Association? Hey, thank you very much, Julie, um, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to come along today. I thought it might just be useful just to put it into context. Caledonia as a housing association, um, we deliver services to people and we deliver those services by people. So people are absolutely key critical to um, our business. And, and just for those um, that may not know us, um, at the moment we've got five and a half thousand properties all across Scotland. 
we've got approximately 200 members of staff. And at present, we've got 70% of our staff working from home. Prior to all this, we had nobody working from home. Uh, and, and now we have 70%. We've got five office locations, but 30% of our staff actually spend a lot of their time in a further 20 locations across the country. So we're quite widely spread in, in terms of, of where we operate. So communications for us is always an issue in how you get messages across and how you maintain that, that momentum. So I was interested to see that people are saying that, that communication is, is more difficult. I think it's, it's always difficult. It's always one of those things that comes up in any staff survey is about communications. So when we went into to lockdown, we really looked at communications in, in two ways. One was about the internal and the other was about the external. And, and those were very different messages that, that we were putting out. In terms of internal, where we've really focused our attention is in four key areas for staff. And, and that's been around sort of all staff updates. So they get a regular update um, and it, it goes out from me, which tells them what's happening, what good news stories there are, and also what we've achieved, and to put into context some positivity. Because at the very early stages, there was an awful lot of uncertainty and anxiety amongst our staff, and real concerns about the future and, and a lot of what is going to happen to us and, and the economy, etc. So very early on we started to put into place some positive messages as well and and that came through our updates we also provided um, opportunities for live q a sessions that i i hosted and that gave a, a real feel for how people were feeling at, at any given time and then we had a staff newsletter that went out weekly over and above that, we then developed a social media platform called Workplace, and uh, we've now got 93% of our staff are engaged on that. And that's where people will share stories about their gardens, about walking their dogs, about seeing their kids. And it might seem quite trivial, but it has meant that it's made us feel all quite connected to each other still. And the uptake and use in that, that media has been phenomenal. Um, and it's also adaptable to allow us to reflect different groups so we can have separate groups there where there are particular interest groups of staff can go and have conversations there. But that has been uh, really successful. In terms of another area that we've been looking at is all about collaboration feedback with the staff. And this is one of the areas that I found quite surprising. We have a, a software package that is called Office Vibe, where we measure staff using Gallup 12 on a regular basis, just so again, we've got some information about the, the, the temperature in the organization and, and the feelings of, of staff. We undertook another one in the midst of all of this pandemic and, and people working from home. And um, the response rate was well above where we would normally have. And um, su surprisingly, I, I was extremely surprised, the rates of satisfaction amongst their staff and the positivity absolutely escalated beyond belief. And one of the key areas that really stood out was all about support and supervision and how people were still feeling useful, valued and connected to the organisation. So that was a really that was a really important piece of work. And since then, we have created an employee forum as well to take forward any actions out of that. But we also now have focus groups that are turning their attention to how do we emerge from lockdown? How do we actually start to get back to not necessarily the way we used to work, because we're quite clear that as we emerge from this, we don't want to be doing the same as what we were doing before, but we want to build on the good things that have happened during lockdown and take them forward as, as an organization. And the other area that we, were, uh, we, we worked hard on was guidance documents for managers and staff and undertaking some manager workshops virtual workshops to help support them through this difficult time because the questions and a lot of the issues that were coming up are things that we had never dealt with and, and people were in 
this working from home scenario that we had never en envisaged. So there was a lot of support mechanisms went in there for the managers and the frontline team leaders as, as well. From that, what I have learned, and, and I think some of the others have picked on this, is that what staff appreciated from me was honest and open communication and saying, I don't know, I don't have that answer just now, I can't tell you, I can't guarantee you that. The other thing that they really valued was me as a chief executive on these live Q&A sessions saying, there are days I've got low energy, there are days that I struggle, there are days that I have to stop work, go away, I need to take a break as well. And that had really quite a profound effect on people. And, and we started to see more people taking that approach and, and taking time out. And I got private messages from staff, which was really encouraging as well. A surprise was that the methods of communication in the organization have shifted slightly. Um, so they're using Zoom a lot more because they, they, they see that as the most closest to the face-to-face -face contact that they can have. And the social media platform, as I say, has, has rocketed. Um, and I now know more about staff members than I did before because I see a lot more of that engagement. It, that has really galvanized staff and we've got what we call a given back. And that is all about now looking at what we can do to help the communities. So there's a huge, we're doing afternoon teas and, and gathering jigsaws and national lottery funding and, and all sorts of things that are going on. And it's staff that are actually getting engaged in that. So it's really galvanizing staff in a, a way that I, I, I would never have expected. And our sickness absence levels have fallen off a cliff. Uh, I know these are just quite practical measures, but you know, there, there is something there that we need to look at in, in terms of that um, the people are in work and working um, and that working from home, those um, satisfaction levels have increased quite substantially. So we need to gather what is being good in all of that. And that's the bit that we, we want to try and analyze with staff. In terms of our external customers, again, that was just about clear and concise information, that clarity of message. It was really important for them to have that. And for us, as a contracting body with a, a wide range of contractors, we needed to understand where our contractors were and what their, their situation was and, and what levels of support and, and service could they still deliver in order for us to, to get those messages out. But our staff got creative and um, for our customers, what they started doing was creating small community Facebook pages where they could put messages out directly to the communities that they were working in. And they started creating WhatsApp groups as well. And again, that was with the local community and they started sharing information there. They also started phoning every single one of our customers to see how they were irrespective of their circumstances, they phoned and tried to make contact with them. And that was overwhelmingly positively received by our customers. So some people that we've never really had much engagement with, we were phoning to say, how are you? Can we help you? Can we direct you to financial aid? Can we help support you in any other way? So that was really, and the, the positivity out of that is that we know our customers much better now. We've got a stronger engagement with them as well. So as we, we do come out of, of lockdown, the, the things that we've taken away is how can, we, how can we harness all of the positivity and, and all of that work and messages and positivity that's coming out of the staff and our customers, how can we harness that and change the way we deliver services going forward so that we don't just default back to what we used to do? And it's all about that clarity of message, being open, being honest, and acknowledging when you don't have the answers. Julie, that's absolutely amazing. And I think I have to say, I'm not really surprised. You know, we've worked with you for over a year now. And I think one of the real skills that you've got is being positive and being, but also being practical. Um, and I think everyone on this, all the panellists on the webinar are, are very much like that to say, look, okay, we probably wouldn't have chosen this situation, but how can we adapt? 
and be flexible and maybe even make it work for an advantage. And there's some amazing examples in there. And I would be really interested to know, you know, as what are the lessons as you emerge from lockdown and what can we what can we share, um, quite frankly. And, and thank you for being so so honest. Thanks to all the panelists for being so honest and sharing um, their learnings. Um, and I think what you said about not being afraid to say you're struggling sometimes too um, and being honest that you don't have all the, the answers and I think if there will be times and obviously that's what came up in the poll that people are struggling with uncertainty that constantly changing position you know even um, with Percept if you think right okay that's it <laughs> the music stopped I've cracked it and then of course something just lobs in from from left field so um, I think it's really important to, to be flexible and adaptable, which isn't always easy, particularly if you're having a bad day. So, so well done, that, that's amazing. Um, Caroline, I'm um, going to move on to you now, and um, I, bio, I see. I'm just going to give you a wee bit of a disclaimer because Caroline actually is one of these few people who started with an organisation um, and is actually a new start with iBioIC and started during lockdown. Um, so I thought it'd be really good for Caroline to share what iBioIC are doing in terms of engaging with their members, but also her experience, because I guess the thing is we are moving into a new normal as we emerge from lockdown. And I think all the tools, whether it's WhatsApp or Facebook groups, whatever, I think we are going to live in a much more online virtual world. So. Um, there's probably things, organisations I know who have dialed in attendees today who are going through recruitment. So if there's any lessons in all of that, Caroline, it'd be great to, great to hear. That's great. That's great. Thanks, Julie. Um, yes, as an organisation, I guess it's a different culture that we are working in. We have to be inventive and we have to be creative in how we continue to work with people. We've got, as a public sector and a member-based organisation, we have a lot of people to connect with and reassure and listen to. Um, and during lockdown, well, Zoom has been fantastic. I uh, spent a lot of time on Zoom, but we've had to find other ways to communicate with people as well. So we've had um, online networking events, which have been good. The, our labs are closed, so some of the staff there have been quite creative in the way they've helped develop a new website, been, been involved in different projects, uh, one of which, as a member organisation, we want to connect with our members and have these events. And having to move them online was a bit of a challenge, um, but we did have a fermentation network event, which went really well. Um, so we had a part of our waste stream as we take byproducts from whiskey or beer manufacturing. So we had a, a tour of a distillery, followed by some of our members presenting. And prior to the, the, the event, we were sent out packages of beer and we had organised a sensory expert from Edinburgh Uni to talk us through beer tasting. So these types of events were really, really good to engage, they're interactive, and they really helped connect the members um, with us. We're, we're, we're speaking to industry, we've got skills, We've got our funders to keep happy. So we've had to have a lot of communication through different methods online, bearing in mind we don't want to over communicate as well. We want to listen to what people, people want from us. Um, yeah, so academic skills, students, uh, business engagement, and critically internally with colleagues. Um, our CEO started in February and he had recruited four new senior members of staff uh, prior to lockdown and also planned a restructure. So. As Julie said, I was one of those people that started during lockdown. Um, so that had to, as a, as a dynamic organisation, I bio, I see you couldn't be seen to stand still. So we pushed forward and Mark brought the new staff. Three of the four new recruits have already started. Um, so it's been interesting trying to build relationships externally with members and academics, with industry and internally with colleagues without having actually met face to face. But I, I do believe that with the combination of methods that we've got in place to keep in contact, it has actually worked really quite well. Um, we had, during lockdown, from, from the beginning, um, the CEO had weekly check-ins with all the staff, Monday mornings, everyone dials in. We all chat for an hour about where we are, what's happening, and also a daily checker, a tracker to check we're starting and really keep aware of people's feelings and, and how people are coping with lockdown. It's, it's, it's an unprecedented situation that we're in and we really need to listen to people both internally and externally. Um, I guess the other things that we have um, 
I guess pointers and issues to consider, I think, was the other thing as we emerged from lockdown. Um, I, I guess continuing to listen to what people want and responding effectively. I don't think people will be travelling quite so much for business, um, travelling into the office. I think a point that was made earlier is I think today a lot of people have realised that they don't need a workplace to work. And that could, I guess, increase job satisfaction. It could change leadership and management to make it more more trusting and, and more empathetic. So um, watching out for Zoom overload um, and really connecting to people, I guess the whole the whole answer is, is, is keeping in communication. It's key to how things happen as we emerge from lockdown. Great, Caroline, that was really, really helpful. Um, I'm conscious of time, um, and I think we've actually all touched on not just what we learned in lockdown, but how we're going to emerge. So if it's okay with the panellists, what I'm going to do is just move on to the questions um, and make sure that we're answering the questions. Um, so if you don't mind, um, I'm going to start just because I'm absolutely fascinated with the idea of, you know, we've, we spend a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of resource on getting people um, to recruit people. So are there any tips really, Caroline, from you about what's worked particularly well or even what's not? And it's, it's really weird because obviously we've just been working with yourself and um, another of your colleagues, um, Debbie, who I think is also on the, the webinar. And it seems really weird, although we've not met in person, we've <laughs> Zoom quite a few times, I feel like we have. So yeah. I don't and you know, I appreciate there is the whole Zoom overload thing as well. We need to balance that. But um, any particular tips if people are going to be recruiting at the moment and bring people on board? What are the things to maybe things maybe to think about, but also things to avoid? Um, yeah, Debbie and I started on the same day along with Russell. Um, and I think well, the fact that we've had each other, I think, has probably been quite helpful. But it's been quite a gradual entrance. You know, we were recruited. We had a few Zoom meetings the first week, um, team meetings introduced to everyone on a regular basis. And I really feel as if we do, the, the connection is there. It's going to be so strange when we do meet in person, but I, it's the same with the members, just really slowly and gradually, not pushing. I think if, if, if the pressure had been there from day one, I think it would have been very different. Um, the, the industry partners, well, I guess in general, just taking it easy and, and being aware that people haven't been in the building. We haven't been in the office. I haven't seen the labs that I'm speaking about. Um, I haven't met my, <laughs> the majority of the colleagues, but you can build really good relationships with, with Zoom and various, you know, it's, it's keeping that communication going. I would say that I've spoken now to everyone within the organisation, a large majority of the members, and through joining in as a sort of member of the, the teams, even if you're not contributing at the start, you can help see how things work, see how the team works together and then gradually slot in and, and fit into that team. So um, I think just it's possibly in some ways there's not that day to day, you know, passing one another and picking up hints and tips as you're working, but we've got some online activities where we do meet one another regularly. We actually have a team away day where we did some, you know, team building and we had a quiz where we, we answered questions about one another and not knowing anyone, it still benefited me greatly. It's still really good to get incorporated into the team. So that was a fantastic team away day that we had during lockdown about a month ago. Great. And some of it is Sorry, Michelle, I'll hand over you to you to, to ask questions if that's okay. Sure. I was just going to add to Caroline. I mean, when Caroline, Debbie and Russell uh, first joined, I, I buy OIC in April. Um, I don't know, Caroline, what your thoughts were on this, but we just did a set. We were conscious that we were coming to uh, a, or one of our quarterly review meetings, uh, progress meetings, and instead of just throwing them all in to it cold, uh, not really understanding how we've been working, what we've been doing, what we've achieved, we did a, just a, a, a meet and greet introductory an introductory session with the three of them just to give them a, an overview of the role of communications and public relations and public affairs work that has had been undertaken to date and how it actually might impact on their roles even though some of them aren't directly responsible for it so Caroline, i don't know what your thoughts on that were eh? <laughs> but if it was a good introduction that maybe when you are bringing new team members into your organization 
it's important to involve your external partners as well as part of the induction process. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to move on to some, some of the questions um, from those attending the webinar today. So thank you everyone in advance of those. Um, we, as I said, I think the panellists have answered quite a few, of, quite a lot of them already. If there's anything we haven't as a result of the, uh, the webinar, uh, we'll get in touch with you or feel free to get in touch with us and, and we, can, we can come back to you. One of the questions that cropped up a few times was about uh, what do customers need to hear during this crisis? So, I guess one of the key things as a, as a communicator, you would say, well, first of all, it's not so much what you think, it's about listening. And the panelists have already reflected on that. Listen to what your customers want, what they're, what they're doing. I think um, COVID has definitely been an unwelcome driver of change. I think it has made us, there's lots of positives coming out of it though. I think your customer behaviour and habits and needs have changed in the past few months. I think they'll continue to change. And the only way you can keep abreast of that is listening. So Mona's doing your social listening across social media channels. Look at what your competitors are doing and what type of engagement they're getting as well, because that will give you an indication or feel for what your customers are, are looking for. Search habits have changed. Um, Traditionally, peak times would be on the commute. The large majority of us aren't doing it anymore. So there's a lot more opportunity to engage online um, with customers um, and members. So I'm going to throw it out to the panel to see if they've got anything they want to add to that. Um, I'm happy to add in. Um, I, I, I thought about that. Um, and I thought about it from two angles. One was us as a customer, because we have quite a lot of contractors and, and, that we, and suppliers that we get services from. But also we then deliver services to a, a huge range of customers. I think in, in terms of us being the customer, um, what I've appreciated uh, that we've had from, from our contractors is uh, an understanding of their preparedness for when they come out of lockdown, because a lot of our planning will be dependent on their planning in, in terms of some of our, our service. And I've really appreciated having a clear understanding of how they are going to emerge from this situation, because it's allowed me to know that they have a good uh, grip on their business and are responding to the changes as they as they come. So as the phases and, and relaxations uh, come about, it's given me a greater degree of comfort that the contractors and the suppliers that we're working with know exactly how they're going to respond and, and how quickly they will be able to, to um, get back up to delivering those supplies or services to us. From um, us as a supplier of a service to the customers that we have, I think it has really just been around making, giving them a degree of confidence that what we are doing is in their best interest and that we are, we are uh, adhering to the safety regulations, that whole issue about personal safety, respecting them as individuals when they've said, no, I don't want anybody to come into my house. I, I, therefore, we've had to do work around. So it's been about being much more flexible, being um, much more engaged in their personal circumstances and understanding them and how our services can, can be tailored to that effect. So for me, it's really one about us knowing our business and where we are and what we can do to respond to this environment but equally what are our suppliers and understanding of the environment and how they respond and and work with us i think that's a really good point julie because um 
there was certainly a lot of communication about going into lockdown and you know we saw it from from the big brands and um certainly as organizations open up but there doesn't seem to be it doesn't seem to be quite as planned or quite as detailed so so that's actually a really useful learning um you know even for for perceptive to reassure that we're absolutely equipped to support our clients and, and indeed we have throughout um, and, and we will continue to going forward but I think that's a, that's a really useful point. From well, for Scotland pr perspective I would say um, our members really want to know that we're on it um, especially when there's been such ambiguity and lack of clarity um, this is when we should really be demonstrating the value of our their investment in us and I think we've been able to do that through um, being accessible they can ask us anything they want um, and we can uh, utilise the relationships we've established with the Scottish Government, especially civil servants, just to be able to sort of ping questions on back and forth and, you know, provide the answers that they need. Yeah, I think now more than ever it's a challenge for all organisations in terms of spend and discretionary spend and things like membership organisations and, you know, don't get me wrong, Homes for Scotland do an amazing job and have, have done an amazing job, a fantastic job as of IYC. Um, but I think, you know, reality is that people will be evaluating, so we need to demonstrate the value um, mm -hmm. and help deal with that uncertainty um, and the value added to the industry. I think this is fantastic. Yeah, I think from IYC's point of view, coming out of lockdown, we partnered with uh, some of our larger multinational members to share the best practices for labs reopening. Um, so that document's on our website and it's been quite well received. It includes like how to social distance um, in labs and offices and in communal areas and guidelines for visitors if you've got people coming into the facility, cleaning, hygiene, travel to and from work and even mental health. Um, we've also got on our website some signage um, for, for hand washing, PPE, and that's just available to download and print off exit and entry and measures to reduce viral spread, really. Fantastic, Caroline. If you don't mind, we'll post that um, on our, we've got a LinkedIn group about effective communication around COVID. Now it was as we go into COVID, it's now as we emerge out of lockdown, which is great. So um, that sounds like some really useful information, really practical tips. Michelle, any other questions? Yep, yeah. yeah. another question that came up, um, again, a lot of online and digital communication. And the question is, how do you stand tall in a comp in competitive market where others have upped their online game? So I think I'd already mentioned, everyone's, on, everyone's using digital channels now. Um, that's, that's going to continue to evolve and improve. Um, but it's, as there's more volume on these channels and people are spending more time, how do you have to cut through in terms of your competitive positioning? Martin, would you want to say something in relation to what you guys are achieving on social media? Yeah, I mean, I think we'd, um, from Clay Gaby's perspective, I'd, we'd made a decision uh, some time back to be much more focused on, on social um, and two things to that I guess really looking at Twitter has been one area in which we would we would promote and what we wanted to adopt on Twitter was a, a more relaxed tone of voice and something that we could use that to kind of also share other messages that are coming out from other organisations whereas on LinkedIn uh, we've got a slightly different tone of voice on LinkedIn which is a bit much more much more uh, professional. We focus on uh, our Clyde Gateway's location advisory team um, and it's there about us kind of sharing our expertise uh, with uh, the broader professional community. And an example of that, and it kind of picks up on the, the earlier point, is that one of my colleagues as part of the location advisory team produces on a daily basis a review of the grants, assistance and business support that's available from the government and from other agencies. Uh, we publish that on a daily basis. We put it on our website. We put it out through uh, through LinkedIn, um, and that's us not getting out a message about Clyde Gateway, but it's getting out messages that supports our companies that, and and customers that supports Clyde Gateway businesses, but it's also used for other people because a, a lot of the things out there that is uh, is overwhelming uh, for a lot of people. So we've tried to try to adopt that position. Um, I'm not certain it's about 
trying to stand out at, at this particular point. I think it's just trying to kind of maintain your position and maintain your integrity uh, through this period and be authentic in your uh, in your messaging. Um, and I'd, I'd, I haven't seen really many kind of situations where companies are trying to be opportunistic as a result of of COVID. You know, possibly if you're selling health and safety equipment, maybe. But uh, other than that, I think it's about just trying to sort of maintain your your position rather than try to adopt something that's more competitive, um, possibly for retail environments and others like that. Again, you know, they maybe want to stand out a little bit more as well. So I've not, not detected a huge change in that over the period, but it's really interesting what you were saying about the way the search uh, is changing um, and, the, and the peak times for that. So I guess a probably a lesson that I'll be taking away from today is, is maybe trying to be, be a wee bit more adaptable uh, in how we're delivering our, our services and messages over the coming weeks. I would absolutely concur what uh, Martin said there about maintaining your integrity, um, especially on the likes of uh, Twitter. And we, we can, we're starting to see it now. I mean, home builders have always been an easy target um, for certain commentators. Um, but I think we've just maintained our professionalism. And in terms of our posting, particularly on LinkedIn, we're making references to the um, added value that we are providing members with. So we're not giving it away for free, but we're making reference to it that it is available. So there, if you if, if you want to if you want to know more, if you want to be in the know, then uh, that's why you need to join. But we've actually over the over since eighteenth of March, we've increased our LinkedIn following by fifty four percent, which is uh, from a basically a stand and start where we were in November is uh, quite impressive. Actually, I'm really happy with that. Great. And well done, Jennifer. Um, and you know, it's great to see you guys harnessing things like social media. Um, I'm just conscious of time, um, so just going to um, launch another um, little poll in a second. Um, but in terms of um, the how we could help um, going forward, hopefully everyone's found this webinar really useful. Um, there's some really amazing pointers that um, I knew we would get from these fantastic panelists, but um, there's even more things that have come out um, that certainly um, hopefully be useful for everybody, but also um, we're going to be taken away for, as a perceptive business. Um, just to let you know that we have been very fortunate in that we've continued to, to work with all of our clients during lockdown, and we're continuing to do that going forward. Um, delivering our usual PR, marketing, social media and public affairs support and indeed the next webinar will be about how can you make public affairs work with you in this new world um, and how do you influence politicians and stakeholders um, because it's a completely different world um, that we're in now. Um, the other thing to say is that we can also provide interim support if that's useful. appreciate some organisations have um, maybe some of their staff on furlough. So if you need an extra pair of hands, um, whether it's just a few hours or even a few days a week, we're happy to do that. Um, and we're providing a lot of training. Uh, now we've cracked this webinar thing. Um, we're doing quite a lot of training on Zoom um, as well, which is actually really, really effective. Um, I would encourage everyone to get involved with the LinkedIn group, and I certainly will be posting that um, IBIOIC um, guidance, um, which sounds really, really practical support. Um, and also, if anybody's interested, who you're, if you're not a client already, um, please, and you've got any questions about communications, please do feel free to pick up the phone. We're happy to, to give you a free 30-minute consultation, um, no strings attached. I'm um, really happy to, to help with that. So um, thank you so much um, to the panel. Um, I'm just going to launch this um, last poll um, for you to um, reply to. And in terms of, um, we will be sending out a wee um, feedback form through SurveyMonkey. But I'll just launch this poll. Okay, right. That's great. Um, so 
100% of the people said that this was uh, worthwhile, so which is great. Uh, and we had some great feedback from the last webinar um, as well. And I say the next one is on the 26th of June, um, two weeks today, um, one till two, where my colleague Devon Scobie will be speaking to um, MSP Richard Lyle about how things it might be different in the new world, but also how to make sure that it's still possible to, to influence politicians and key stakeholders. So, um, so thank you so much to the panelists. Um, absolutely amazing input, um, some really great ideas, and I really appreciate your time. I know you're all really busy people with lots of things to do, and I think it's been very generous of you to be so honest and open and practical with your your guidance. So, thank you very much for that. Okay. okay. So I'm um, just going to um, sign off now. I think we're managing to finish up three minutes early. That must be some kind of record, certainly for the webinars I've been listening to anyway. Um, so thank you very much again. And uh, look, hopefully um, look out for you in the LinkedIn group uh, and we'll let you know about the, the next webinar. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you.